Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Thank you so much for joining us again today on the broadcast, and uh, I trust you have uh, been enjoying the things we've been sharing. Probably over the last six weeks, we have probably broken some new ground. Uh, Once again, let me just say to you, even as we begin to break up new ground or fallow ground, if you will, uh, that uh, we don't necessarily demand that people believe everything we say it just like we say it. What we're doing is developing in our theology, uh, just like I think we all ought to be constantly learning. Long before I was ever a teacher, I was a student, and I remain a student to this day. And I believe the more we remain students, the more we're able to learn. Uh, what the Spirit is saying to the church. Uh, You know, one of the things that I think is the enemy to growth in the church is that we uh, simply accept uh, thoughts and concepts that have been handed down to us without ever challenging them or thinking about them. It should never be downplayed that people should not think when they read the Word of God and challenge and research and look. You know, one, many of the things that we have found and discovered in what we have studied over the book of Revelation, and especially those of you who followed us over the many years and heard us teach this book, have seen the progression as God has continued to add some pieces to us. And uh, many of these concepts uh, we have learned even as we go and are still learning. Uh, we are still learning. And so, uh, uh, You know, I believe we're living in a day when people are not satisfied with the status quo anyway, and they're starting to realize that a whole lot of stuff that has been preached, especially from the book of Revelation, is not panning out. Therefore, at least consider the possibility that there just might be another view of this book. And uh, to me, the more I dig around in it, the more uh, it's like a great onion, the more you peel it, the more layers you find it has. And it's like uh, the unsearchable riches of Christ. But we have built for probably 70 some weeks now teaching the book of Revelation. Had no idea it would take us this long. But your response has been one of the things that has absolutely encouraged me to continue to teach this even in the face of, uh, you know, what may be criticism. But I found out a long time ago, it doesn't matter what you preach Somebody's going to love you, and somebody's going to hate you. Uh, but my, my passion for truth is really, I, I hope if, if you don't agree even with what I'm teaching here, don't quit on us in the future as we share maybe something, uh, you know, as we begin to move beyond the eschatology and uh, maybe other things that you could agree with us on that you may not agree with this issue. Uh, to me, they are not uh, things that should break our fellowship. I have a lot of friends who do not see uh, some of the eschatology like I do, but that's perfectly all right with me. We're still friends. We're not enemies. I think one of the things happens is that we, we feel like if someone doesn't believe in times like we do that they're our enemy. That, uh, that, that's the furthest thing from my mind. I believe that, uh, that others that are teaching different things, even that you probably may watch on other channels, are, are no doubt born again, spirit-filled men of God. We are just different levels of understanding, and I think it's okay to disagree as long as we're not disagreeable. Uh, but what we want to do is offer you, offer you, as we share many of these things, an eschatology of victory. What we want to show you is that we've said things like I've read the last book of the Bible, and we win except the way some teach it we don't win. Uh, I believe that this book is a revelation of Jesus, and we've laid that out in great, great detail in the past. Uh, we're going to move into an, a section this week in um, the book of Revelation uh, to kind of uh, unpack some things, especially from the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. The last couple of weeks we dealt with the resurrection of the martyrs and uh, uh, the fact that uh, we're not all going to sleep, but we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We dealt with a lot of those things in the past week, and uh, I, I, I was tempted to jump past uh, the 11th chapter, or, you know, actually what we're going into today is we're going to begin to unpack for the next several weeks some things from the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. So if you want to go ahead and open your Bible there, that's cool. Uh, But we're going to be dealing with the 12th chapter of Revelation. I almost wanted to jump ahead, though, and uh, connect some thoughts I had last uh, week uh, with uh, Revelation, the 20th chapter, because we've had several people ask us questions uh, concerning uh, the millennium and the millennial reign of Christ. And uh, we we will unpack a lot of that when we get to the 20th chapter 
uh, you know, I, I will say this because people have asked us, do we believe that the millennium has already been fulfilled? And there's a lot of diversity of different lines of thought, especially in the different camps. I think uh, uh, probably I think some people believe that the 30, the, I'm sorry, the 40 year gap from 30 A.D. to 40 or to 70 A.D., that 40 year gap was the millennial reign. Uh, that to me is too much of a stretch for me. Uh, I don't know if he, that's the, if that would have been the case. He would have just said that generation or he would have used the same kind of terminology. But I will say this. I believe that we are in the millennium right now and that we have been in the millennium for some time. And uh, the reason I say that is because that we are already ruling and reigning with Christ. And we will touch some of that as we get into the seed of the woman in the book of Revelation here, uh, where she was called up with him to rule the nations with a rod of iron and to quote a scripture from uh, one of the promises to the seven churches. He says to him that overcometh, I will give him power over the nations. And like the vessels of a potter, shall they be broken in shivers. And uh, he goes on to tell that, that he gives authority to the believers to rule and reign with him. I believe that we should be ruling and reigning with him right now. Now, let me say this to you, because I think that that, uh, at least for my view, this is my, this is my educated opinion. And that is that, uh, 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 that, that the purpose, you know, people say, well, if, if all of this stuff has been fulfilled, then what does the future look like? Well, I think the future is determined by what the church does and believes. I mean, I believe the ultimate future is determined in Christ, and that is that we win. But what happens in our generation is determined by what we preach, what we believe, and what we act on. And I'm so appreciative to, especially even in the dimensions of some things that are taught from faith, and that is that the believer has authority. Uh, you know, uh, Psalm 8 says this. It says, when I consider the heavens and the, the stars and the works of your fingers and all that you has created, what is man that you are mindful of him? You made him a little lower than the angels and you crowned him with glory and honor and you gave him dominion over the works of your hands. God put the authority to have dominion in the hands of his vice regent, Adam in a misty garden over 6,000 years ago, and he certainly has put in the hands of his second man, Adam, the dominion once again, and the dominion that was given to Christ, who was the last Adam, uh, he has handed back even to the church as a part of his body. He's the head, we're the body. But through this body, uh, when he ascended, he said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth, go ye therefore. And then he said, I, behold, I give you power. Uh, to tread on serpents and scorpions and uh, whatever you bind in, on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth has been loosed in the heavens. And, and the authority he hands to the believers. Now, I, I'm jumping way ahead of some things that I'm going to deal with. I, I said all that to say to you that uh, the one thing that I do believe, at least my opinion, uh, from the book of Revelation, uh, or one of the things that I believe is still an ongoing reality is that we are ruling and reigning with Christ right now. You say, well, what about the thousand years? Is that a literal thousand? Is it, a, uh, is it an idiom? Is it a symbol? Well, in a book that's highly symbolic, let me say this to you. Let me just, let me just submit this thought to you. David writes in the book of Psalms, and he says this. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, let me ask you, if you say that, do you, does that mean that God doesn't own a thousand and one cattle? I, I don't think that's what he's trying to say. I think it's really an idiom that means that God owns the cattle on a, on a thousand hills. So when I see him saying that they rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years, I think it simply doesn't denote an exact amount of time, except that it would be uh, an idiom or a saying that would be like, uh, you know, uh, I love you to the nth degree or, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, or, or a thousand times yes, or uh, whatever kind of a, a terminology you'd want to use like that. In other words, it is simply uh, denoting a long period of time where God will use the church, I believe, to continue to keep Satan bound, who was bound at the cross, who was defeated at Calvary, who was disarmed in Colossians chapter 2, who is a defeated foe. That foe has a great chain. And that chain is more than just a piece of iron wrapped around him, but I believe a great chain of truth that as we continue to declare the truth, uh, Satan has no authority, <coughs> excuse me, in the life 
of the believers or the life of the church. And I believe, and the reason I'm so passionate about preaching stuff like this is to get the church to arise to a place where our whole lives are not encompassed with evacuation, but our uh, whole lives are being trained and engulfed in seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and occupation, because he said occupy. And so I believe that's a military term where it talks about taking a beachhead. I believe that there ought to be territories that we as the church are invading with the kingdom of God for the kingdom of God is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of meal. Uh, you know, like I said, I believe that, the, that, 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 there, uh, that, that Satan has been bound in the work of the cross. I believe that the uh, devil has been defeated. I, I, believe that, uh, uh, I, I believe that there are, as I shared with you in the last six segments, that uh, especially of the martyrs that were crying under the altar, how long, Lord, till thou dost avenge us. Uh, you know, uh, let, let, me, let me go ahead and touch some of this. You know, since I'm here, I, I really wasn't planning on going to, to Revelation 20, but I might, because of the setting uh, of what we've already shared concerning um, uh, the things we've shared over the last six uh, weeks, dealing with the trumpets in the book of Revelation, and the last trump being the trump where the Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout, which is a war cry, a cry of command, and a call of incitement, and the dead were raised. And we shared with you uh, last couple segments how that that resurrection is not something that was in our future, but Paul told the church at Thessalonica, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep that you saw or not. And then Paul keeps on using personal pronouns by saying, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an hour. And, and he, is, he is audience relevant talking to that church at Thessalonica. And we talked about how that from the time that the old covenant ended, and especially when once the temple was destroyed, because Hebrews, uh, the book of Hebrews said that the way into the most holy place, into heaven itself, was not yet open while the first tabernacle still stood. So once that tabernacle uh, was completely destroyed and everything that had the residues of an old covenant and a covenant of death was destroyed, once that covenant of death was destroyed and disannulled, according to the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 28, your covenant with death will not stand, that that's when the the, uh, you know, I believe that there was a resurrection of those that from Adam until, uh, until Christ slept. Because once they died under the old covenant, they slept with their fathers. In the new covenant, we will not all sleep. In other words, he has already brought life and immortality to light. That's why when you go out to the graveyard, you're not out there uh, and your mom is not in the grave. And we've said that, you know, whenever or your dad or whoever you're burying, we said that, you know, it amazes me sometimes at funerals how that pastors will say things like, well, mom went to home to be with the Lord. And to that, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, you know, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, and then we go out to the grave. We go, well, that great getting up morning, you know, mom's going to get up and, uh, you know, uh, um, and, and you, you know, and then we go out to the grave and it's ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And I'm like, well, where's mom at? You know, is she in heaven or is she not in heaven? Well, the truth is, is that she is not out there in the grave. Mom has went home to be with the Lord. And see, that would not have happened under the old covenant. Mom would have slept with the fathers like all the old covenant saints did who slept. And that's why they were even in the book of Revelation under the altar crying, how long? They are under the altar. They, are, uh, they have not been transferred, if you will, into uh, the heavenly holy of holies. Uh, but they are literally... They were literally crying how long? Their blood was crying from the ground. Of course, you know that Matthew 23, Jesus said that, that, that the blood of the martyrs from the blood of righteous Abel to Zacharias would come upon that generation of people that were alive and well during this time of destruction when Jerusalem was destroyed. So we're not all going to sleep, but we're going to be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye so that from, that, from then on, those of us who are alive and remain from that moment on, we do not sleep. We are changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, something happened, and I showed that to you in prior segments, that the last trumpet happened at the destruction of the temple in Revelation chapter 11, so that from that moment on, believers do not sleep. 
but they are changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, and they are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And the word air there in the book of First Thessalonians is not the Greek word oranus, which means heaven. It is the Greek word that means to breathe literally, to expire air or to exhale. So what he's simply saying is the moment you take your last breath, uh, that, that moment that you sh- take that last breath, you step from here to eternity into the presence of God and you receive not a physical body, but you received a redeemed spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body, but that which is sown is not what is raised, but what is raised is incorruptible, it is immortal, it is imperishable. And I think that's incredibly good news. Now let me just, because I'm just going to try to grab this and, and do it some kind of justice us on the end of that because I've already laid the groundwork in the last six segments for you. But chapter 20 said, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which worship not the beast. So this had to have relevance to some folks that were alive. And well, during this period of time, when even the beast was demanding worship, and in the next couple segments, I'm going to deal with the beast and show you that it was the beast of Rome and its seven heads and its ten horns. And I'm going to show you exactly which kings they were and who was in power when what happened. But suffice to say that these people uh, were those that were beheaded. These were the martyrs that are coming from the sixth uh, chapter, I believe it is, of the book of Revelation, sixth and seventh, somewhere in that range where they're crying, how long till thou dost avenge us? And then he tells them in chapter uh, 10, 11, that these are the days of vengeance. The temple was being destroyed. And a moment the temple was destroyed, the moment the temple was destroyed in Revelation chapter 11, the dead were raised. I I hope you're making the connection with this. But what is happening is, is that those that were beheaded, this is again the same group of people that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God that didn't worship the beast, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. I believe they are right now living and reigning with Christ. I don't believe they're just over on some cloud stroking harps, uh, you know, stepping on clouds. I believe they become a great part of what Hebrews called the great cloud of witnesses that cheer us on that are encouraging us, uh, uh, I think they become part of the angelic host. That's probably a can of worms that uh, I don't know how, uh, to, I, I have to take a long time to develop some of that, but just suffice to say uh, that the scripture talks about, are they not all ministering spirits that are sent forth into the earth who shall be the heirs of salvation? So there are many uh, uh, examples throughout the scriptures of angels who were men. As a matter of fact, the angel that showed John this revelation, John later in the book of Revelation falls down at the feet of the angel that showed him this revelation. And the angel says to him, see thou do it not, for I am one of thy fellow servants. I'm one that keeps the testimony of this book. You see uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration where Moses and Elijah come and they minister to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. If you've ever been with someone who was passing away, the moment uh, they are making their final transition, they begin to talk to people from the other side. And they never get mixed up with people on this side. They either see their husband or their uh, or Jesus or, uh, or one of their loved ones that I believe come to help them make the transition. So I'm simply saying that uh, maybe ministry doesn't stop. And, you know, that, that, those are all just issues of opinion. But what I'm trying to tell you is that we are living and we are reigning with Christ right now a thousand years. Satan has been bound. Let me say this to you. The bottomless pit, a lot of places, the word sea could also be translated as the word abyss. When they, some matter of fact, some places it does translate it as sea uh, or abyss. And um, immediately my mind goes to the Red Sea crossing where in the waters of baptism, when God baptized, 
three to six million Israelites when they came up out of Egypt, the same water that saved them was the same water that destroyed their enemy. So I submit to you that the waters of baptism is one of the things that draws a line to your adversary, the devil, that keeps him bound from deceiving. Because once the truth comes, he can't deceive the nations any longer. You say, well, I see a lot of darkness still in the world. And, and to that I agree. Yes, there are some things that I believe are still active that the devil is doing. But I believe that what happens is doesn't mean he doesn't operate at all according to the scripture. It's just that his boundaries are set and they are limited. And I believe they get even more limited as the people of God continue to create this great chain because what you bind on earth has already been bound in the heavens. So as far as God's concerned, he's defeated. As far as God's concerned, he's disarmed. As far as God's concerned, he cannot devour you. But he goes about as a roaring lion, and all he has is a mouth, and he tries to seek whom he may devour. Uh, whom he may devour are those who do not know the truth. But when you know the truth, the truth will make you free. So when I see this thousand years, I don't see it necessarily as a physical, exactly thousand years, but as a simply the reign of Christ throughout uh, uh, a long span of time. And uh, those who are believers live and reign with Christ. And from that moment that they take their last breath, even as they, uh, as you see them being raised here, uh, they don't sleep. Now the rest of the dead, which I believe are the wicked dead, live not again, according to Revelation chapter 20, said, but the rest of the dead, uh, Live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now the rest of the dead to me are the wicked dead, because he that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. The scripture talks about there is a resurrection of the just and a resurrection of the unjust. I believe one of the things that unbelievers definitely miss and that is they miss everlasting, or what is the Greek word, aeonian, or age-enduring life. One of the things they do not enjoy is they do not enjoy what these other believers who have died enjoy, and that is living and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. One of the things, one of the things that they have lost is they have lost aeonian or eternal or the life of the age because they don't live again until the thousand years are finished. God does not deal with the wicked dead again until the thousand years are finished. And he said, this is the first resurrection and blessed and holy is he that has part, uh, he, that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. According to the scripture, we're already kings and priests of God. Uh, that's the promise he made to one of the church. Now, uh, the, the, the first resurrection to me, to make it as simple as I know how to, because we're so limited in time here, is what was the first death? Well, the first death was the first one that Adam did. It was a spiritual death. He disobeyed God in rebellion. Death came as a result of his disobedience. And so the first death was a spiritual death. It took Adam a thousand years, almost a thousand years, to live. Uh, or, or to die, I'm sorry, it took him almost a thousand years to die once he tasted of spiritual death. Here's an interesting concept. You and I have tasted of spiritual life, which the first resurrection is simply being born again. If the first death was a spiritual death, then the first resurrection is a spiritual resurrection. And if you've already had a spiritual resurrection, then the second death, which is physical death, should have no power on you. In other words, uh, uh, that, that, that second death is, you, you are not going to uh, remain in the grave uh, for a later dealing of God, but you are going to live and reign with Christ for that thousand years as priest of God. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. He'll go out into the nations to, to, to gather them to battle, the number of whom is upon the sand of the sea. And he and when they went on the breadth of the earth, compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. The fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. 
And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the works. So the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell uh, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That is such a vast subject in itself to deal with, except I can't get into the details of that, at least in this segment, but I will say this, that death and hell are different than the lake of fire. What you see here happening in this chapter of the book of Revelation is that death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. So whatever this lake of fire is, it is designed to destroy death, hell. It is designed for the devil. It is designed for, uh, let me see, uh, it is designed uh, for the beast, the false prophet, and uh, they are the ones being tormented in this lake of fire. And so what the lake of fire does is it ultimately destroys death and hell. Now, let me say this to you as clearly as I know how to. You are blessed if you're part of the first resurrection. There are some parts of this chapter that I don't fully have a grasp on, so I don't even pretend to. What God does in the ages of eternity is up to him. I will tell you this. I do believe there is a definite benefit to being born again. I do believe that you must be born again to inherit the kingdom of God. I do believe that uh, he that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. If any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. I don't know about you, but I don't want to give up any of this life uh, to be dealt with in some future thing uh, or some, 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 some punishment or there a resurrection of the just and there is a resurrection of condemnation according to the book of Daniel. I would rather be in the resurrection of the just and enjoy living and reigning with him right now. I believe we are part of that and I believe that you don't even have to wait till you physically die to do that. We are part of that right now. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that on this particular segment. I, I didn't even mean to get into that there, uh, but I trust that helps you put some pieces together for some of the things we've shared as well uh, from the book of Revelation. We're about to run out of time. Take a moment to write, uh, call the number on the screen, sow a seat into the ministry to help us keep preaching the gospel of the kingdom. If you appreciate what you're hearing, please get behind it. Don't wait on someone else to do it. We are breaking new ground, and those of you who are embracing and hearing what I'm saying, so into it to help us continue to say it while we have the opportunity on the air to share some of these things to help folks have a revelation of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. Call the number on the screen. God bless you. For anyone struggling to understand John's writings in Revelation, this book provides true, biblically-based answers. Through detailed insights into the letters John wrote to the seven churches of his day, you will learn how to avoid the mistakes of the early church to overcome today's trials and tribulations. This book will provoke you to thought and dialogue, bringing greater clarity and revelation of Jesus Christ.